our, our final speaker here before lunch, who is uh, Dr. Pontus Brandt. He has a PhD in space plasma physics from the Swedish Institute of Space Physics in Karuna, Sweden. He's currently a senior professional staff scientist at John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. So, uh, I'm Pontus Brandt. I hate to stand before, uh, between you and lunch and the food, uh, so I'll try to make this fast. From APL, as I said before, we're the guys who are doing the New Horizons mission and uh, launching solar probes soon. I work with Ralph McNutt, uh, Michael Paul, uh, Mike Rishkevich, he's, he's our boss on the block. I also work with Tom Kermedius on this. All right, so I am here to talk to you about um, how do we do this today? You know, for a minute, you forget about uh, solar sails, forget about laser propulsion. What can we do today? So, so we've been discussing interstellar probes for, what, 60 years now, right? Uh, there, some things have happened, of course. Uh, so first, a little definition here. Uh, an interstellar probe or a precursor, um, historically, it's been sort of out to 200 AU within 30 years or so. But we really need to talk about 1,000 AU within about 50 years or so. Uh, it would be, at least to me, the boldest undertaking in space exploration. Um, so they, we have a long line of history here. It started uh, even before this with uh, names like the Deep Space Probe and the, the Ultra Planetary Probe and things like this, uh, Jupiter Galactic Probe. None of these are actually names of mission. They morphed into other missions. But then we have other lines of, of known missions. We have Pioneer, we have Voyager in 77, and then, of course, New Horizons. And uh, believe it or not, uh, Solar Probe is very related to an interstellar uh, probe mission because of the Oberth maneuver that will be. So uh, Parker Solar Probe will be launched next year. Um, this is a little bit about the history here. It started already in the 60s when we talked about, when they talked about an out outer solar system probe to be aimed, aimed away from the sun. Um, and then in 65, Eugene Parker, he is still alive. Um, and I met him actually two days ago. Um, and he started advocating for a mission to this heliospheric boundary region to, to really uh, explore the boundaries into, into the local interstellar medium. Then 77, Voyager 1 launch, and now as of last week, Voyager 1 is about at 139.9 and uh, at an asymptotic speed of about 3.6 AU per year. So that's, that's the velocity, that's the escape velocity we're at right now. As any other missions that I've been involved in, uh, everything is science-driven. Uh, all the missions are science-driven. Uh, the one closest to my heart, and also historically here, is, uh, is our astrosphere, or the heliosphere. You, you've probably seen the abundance, well, it's not maybe an abundance, but numerous astrospheres being um, observed in the UV by Hubble Space Telescope. These are stars of various, various ages that, that show um, how they build up bow shocks and, and, and tails as they plow through their interstellar medium. And in fact, none of these are like our own heliosphere because we cannot see our own heliosphere in UV. We can see it with other methods such as this one, which is called ENA imaging. So that brings about that we, we don't really understand at all what our heliosphere lo really looks like. And if, if you look back at this, these are other astrospheres that are harboring other exoplanetary systems that may harbor life. Uh, so, so we need to make that sort of connection happening here. And of course, these are also new astrophysical plasma conditions that we need to get out and, 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 uh, and explore and understand. Uh, next big science target was uh, brought on by, by New Horizons. And uh, I know probably all of you have looked at the images. And uh, maybe some of you, just like me, before they launched that mission, they, I, I argued, well, guys, you, you're spending this much money for a four-hour flyby. Are you nuts? But look at the images. They were totally worth it. And, and we have a whole host of other KBOs out there. KBOs are not just gravel uh, circulating around there. Um, this one here is, a, is just one that we have targeted, and that's um, the dwarf planet uh, Quawar. 
Uh, it's located about 40 to 50 AU out in, in the nose direction of the heliosphere, so that's conveniently lines up uh, with that physics. Um, it's very interesting because it, it's sort of bordering on, on those, um, how should I say, not airless, but atmospheric-less bodies versus the, 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 the bodies that actually have atmosphere. So we, we do believe that this, this is in the last stages of, of, of losing its atmosphere. Uh, next one, uh, this is a pretty recent uh, image from back in 2009, a discovery of a young planetary system, very young star in the middle, and uh, this is accumulated from, from several different, different observations, I believe. But it shows spiral arms in an irregular fa fashion. And it, it turns out that this is, this is most likely the manifestation of planetary evolution going on in that young exoplanetary system. And, uh, and sitting inside our own bubble and the zodiacal dust cloud, we have no clue what that dust distribution looks like. We don't know what our circumsolar disk looks like. So if we pop outside that bubble and take a look at it in very simplistic terms, that's a huge science driver for, for a mission like this. Uh, won't dwell on this. This is, could be truly and potentially groundbreaking. There are Maybe some engineering details to work out, but we'll save that for, for this afternoon. Now to my little, you're starting to become my little pet, pet, pet favorite here, I guess. Planet Nine. Number one, we don't even know if it exists, right? Uh, so this was uh, Konstantin Batygin and Michael Brown who, who announced this um, uh, hypothesis, I would say. So it came about as they looked at the, the, the clustering of KBO. So if you look at the clustering and the argument of perihelion, it actually clusters around. It's not a lot of data points here, but it's statistically significant. One of the solution is a big planet about uh, 10 times the mass of Earth. So this is nothing like, like Pluto or Quawar. This is, this is pretty big. Uh, slightly inclined, the solutions uh, suggest that it's slight, slightly inclined with a apoapsis of about 1100 AU. There's a range to it. Uh, and a periapsis of 200 AU. That's sort of within reach. That would be a, a, a huge target if it exists. So that's something we, we're definitely keeping our eyes, eyes on. All right, so let's get into the, the technical, technical stuff and, and, and try to be realistic here. I hope I, I won't disappoint you too much. Payload, this is my only slide on payload. Um, obviously, there will be an interstellar medium and heliospheric suite uh, of particle plasma magnetic field instrumentation. Uh, we call this also an ENA camera to take that snapshot back at our own astrosphere. Uh, so it's a particle camera, dust detector to get that spatial, uh, the radial spatial distribution, also size distribution of dust as you go out. Uh, and then, uh, of course, very importantly, imaging systems. There have been imaging systems that, we're, that people are looking at. Um, it's been reported in the KISS uh, report from the KISS study. Uh, so we have optical and infrared can they, they be combined. There have been uh, proposals to do that. The optical would, of course, do the flyby imaging of, of KBOs. Um, of course, the trade-off there is that the faster you fly, the less photons you collect and the more smear. Uh, this one here is from Bacchanal. This is a sort of integrated suite of, of, of optical and, 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 uh, and IR instruments in the same package. All right. Flowing down from science targets and science requirement, uh, we come to mission requirements. And, and that's how we build missions that fly uh, eventually. So historically, as I said, um, it's been 200 AU in about 30 years. Uh, but we do need to extend that discussion and those trade-off studies to 2,000 AU within 50 years because of the science target that I just, uh, I just explained. And, and also that this would be much more impactful if we want to sell it. So that's tremendously important to remember this. Um, we need to consider all possible missions that launch between now and 2015. I don't think that's really changed. Uh, what we want to do is look at existing launch hardware. We don't want to wait for you know, new technology, no in-space assembly. That will complicate uh, matters too much. Trivial, we got to launch to escape velocities, of course. And keep the technology and hardware development to, to, to a minimum. And this one, not to be underestimated, we need to use that adequate margin philosophy uh, to achieve that lifetime reliability. So, so the folks of you have been involved in missions, you know, we're, we're burdened with these margins on margins on margins, and they just pile up. 
So if we were to have those margins back in the Voyager days, I'm not sure if we, we would have flown that mission, to be honest. Uh, so somehow we got to get around that. Um, okay, so uh, let's get back into the trade-off studies that we've, that we've done here. So the first one, uh, I think uh, Slava already showed, um, and that's uh, direct launch into, into a Jupiter gravity assist. No sun involved here, okay? Um, and what we do is to take the best of the best, best and basically, as Ralph McNutt would put it, stack that sucker up. So this is the SLS 1B uh, block. Uh, up here we have uh, another stage of the, the cryogenic stage, the interim cryogenic stage. We also assume um, uh, the caster 30XL. And then on top of that, that itty bitty piece is the 450 gram model spacecraft based on New Horizons. Um, and this also sits on top of a Star 48 uh, solid rocket engine. I forgot to put that there, but that's tremendously uh, important. And so there's your star 48. If you do that solution with, with the passive Jupiter gravity assist, you can get to, as a reference, and you can do the math, um, well, maybe not because it will slow down further, <laughs> uh, 27 years to about 200 AU. Okay? So that's number one. Remember this number. Next one is rendezvous with Rama, essentially. Um, there's a little, another engineering detail there. We need a heat shield, right? Uh, luckily, we, we are developing heat shields that will actually pull it off, we hope. Launching next year, so we're better, right? Uh, this is taken from, from Hermann Ober's uh, publication back in 1929. It's actually a pretty, pretty nice read. For, for scientists, uh, so I urge you to go online and find it. I'm, I'm sure it's out there, otherwise I can send you a copy of the translated version. But he, he, he looked at it, he had a, you know, Gedanken experiment where he put an astronaut with a rocket with a fixed amount of fuel, an asteroid, and asked the reader, uh, how would this astronaut uh, get to the distant uh, star the fastest? And, and the right answer was that astronaut would have to wait for about two centuries until, until he was in the position to fall into the sun's gravity well, and then he would fire the engine. And then that would be the fastest way to get there. Anyway, if you crank in the numbers, it's pretty simple. Uh, for a 1,000 AU within 50 years, you need a delta V of about uh, 15 kilometers per second at 4 RS, perihelion burn, okay? Um, or if you go even lower, that, will, uh, that is about 10.3 uh, kilometers per second uh, perihelion burn. Today, the star 48, we can cream out about 4 kilometers per second. So that's where we're at. Um, heat shield. This here is a picture of the Parker Solar Pro back home uh, in building 28. Uh, the heat shield sits on top here, and the entire probe is, is in shadow behind us. Um, what are, is not included in this mass estimate is all the, uh, the structural support, all the cooling systems that go with it. So it's kind of a counterintuitive way of, of, of doing a mission, actually. You, you, are, are you diving into the sun to get out to extremely cold conditions in outer space? I mean, but that's what we're talking about. That's the big trade-off here. Uh, the payoff could be huge. So anyway, a perihelion burn of about 2 RS, roughly about 900 kilograms. Uh, if you do go out to about uh, 3 or 3.5, three it's up to 550 kilograms or down to. Uh, do the calculations. So for at 3.5 uh, RS, you, you, you reach an asymptotic speed of about 8.3 AU per year. And that's 39 years to 200 AU. If you do like Solar Probe today, which is about a nine and a half RS per helium burn, uh, that goes down to 6.7 AU per year. And if you look at how you're actually climbing out of the gravitational well, that will take you about 47 years to get to 200 AU. So currently, it's not really much better than a passive uh, JGA, um, Jupiter gravity assist. Okay, um, just a quick summary of, of, of mass power data and propulsion here. Um, so again, uh, we base it on a 450 kilogram uh, New Horizons spacecraft payload, uh, not to exceed is about 38, 40 kilograms. New Horizons was 30 kilograms payload, so we have a chance here. 
heat shield, as I said, up to 900 uh, kilograms. Uh, the power best choice today is the general purpose R2Gs. We, we, we have flown them. We know they work. Ulysses, Galileo, Cassini, New Horizons. Uh, for example, the, what was it, the multi 100 watt R2G on Voyager, it uh, still has 170 watts uh, worth, of, worth of life in it after more than 40 years, 40 years and some months, right? Uh, then we have the MM RTGs. Th they do require lifetime extensions, and that's ongoing. Communication, there's been uh, discussions about a KA band, which is proven, and we know it works. It's 160 bits per second. It's not giving you much, but you have time to download it, right? And it has very benign pointing requirements. It's a safe, low-risk uh, option to go with laser. I'd love to have this rate, which is, I think is quoted for a 10 or 100 AU. I can't remember. Uh, but the pointing requirements are insane there, of course. And then uh, propulsion, we're uh, assuming a launch vehicle, as I said, uh, solid rocket, versus the solar electric, uh, radioisotope electric, and nucle nu nuclear uh, electric. If you look at those, the current TRL and the mass to power ratios, it is nowhere near yet where, the, where they need to be, of course. So, so our best option today is to start 48 stacked on top of this big, big vehicle. All right, uh, two last slides. Next step, um, we need to conduct a study team. There are other study teams out there. Uh, we need to get serious about this, I think. Uh, phase one, so this will, as Mark Millis points out, this will be uh, all under the Act One. So uh, of, of this first study, we propose a feasibility and trade-off study on the existing te technologies. As I mentioned, the old Earth versus the, the Jupiter gravity assist. Uh, followed by other uh, phases where we do a detailed risk analysis. We put the roadmap down of, of how we want to do it, do strategic analysis of investment and stuff like this. Um, this needs to get into the decadal uh, midterm reports as soon as possible. It's already in, mentioned in the heliophysics uh, decadal, but we need to get it into the planetary as well if we need to have traction on this. Um, talked about the RTGs, uh, and of course, we need to go uh, international and seek continuing import, uh, support around the world for this. Somewhat philosophical concluding remarks. Last slide. Uh, incessant obsolescence postulate. Thank you for that term, Mark. I've never really heard about, uh, about it before, but uh, basically means when do we really go, right? Uh, and in essence, you know, 100 years from now, we will still s ask that same question. But yet, that has never really uh, inhibited us from, from doing exploration. So that question is kind of obsolete. So I, I really resonate with, with Mark's conclusion there. Uh, so I do think interstellar precursor probe, we, it's time to really get serious about it. I mean, what can we do today to, to, uh, to break that path? It's not to be first, it, it's because we need, to, we need to scope out the deepening waters of that ocean that we're setting out on. It, it's a scout. Uh, so in conclusion, we, we do achieve uh, asymptotic uh, speeds today that are twice that of uh, Voyager. We have the heat shield technology, we can optimize it, we can build further on the, on the solar probe results, of course. And, and also, very underestimated, we, we, we need this precursor to also um, push that programmatic transformation that is needed to support these multi-generational uh, missions. It's funding across administrations, it's rel reliability requirements and, and all things like this. So w with this, I'm going to take some questions, and I'm done. And you're holding up this. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. I have ten minutes left. This is only a 15-minute talk. OK. <laughs> you owe me one. <laughs> when you're talking about the multi-generational um, programmatic transformation, um, what about staffing? How do, you, how do you think you'll be able to persuade new staffers to come on board something that they may never see the uh, uh, results from? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I, you know, I can't really answer it. The only thing I can say is that we're already doing that, this today. So uh, I'm, I'm leading an instrument development effort for, for uh, the Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer right now. And, and in the proposal, we were required to put that in. How do you transfer your knowledge to the next generation? So it's already happening. 
So of course, it, 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 it's when you grow up as a PI and you push, push that mission, you have to engage already then your undergraduate and your graduate students. And, and just from that pool of, of, of brains and talents, one individual will rise to the top. That, that's my theory, but you really need to go down to undergraduate and graduate, and we gotta do it if we wanna do it. So. Um, with the payload mass and uh, power levels that you gave, those values, um, I know there's usually uncertainties with that. Is, uh, what sort of range of uncertainties are that? And there's a part B to this question, and I assume those numbers come from uh, technology readiness, ready to fly type of technologies. If you take that to the next uh, lower technology readiness level, about how much does that reduce? Is there some ballpark numbers you can give me on that? Uh, so let me first see if I understand your question. Yeah. Uh, so, so the 40 kilograms that I quoted, that's the not to exceed mass of this model payload. Mm -hmm. um, New Horizons had 29.9 kilograms of payload did not include all the things we want to include. So if you rack it up and compare it to other missions like Ulysses and others, uh, we're still way over. Um, so rather the 40 kilograms is a target and we're not there yet, but I say within you know, the next 10 years, we will see those developments coming down to that number for that required payload. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that kind of yeah. gives me an idea of what sort of Yeah, it, it's hard, it's hard to get to 40 yeah. kilograms. That's okay. it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. With all of these uh, possible deep space missions that are, you know, an exploratory one to see how deep the ocean is and then some further ones and some big telescopes, you know, we really don't have that much plutonium for the heat generators hanging around. Is there a... I mean, do you have a solution or a suggestion? Because uh, to power sources, no, I don't. I th I think uh, I think you, we've seen an increase in in the decades, and that's uh, a lot thanks to Ralph McNutt. Actually, he's really been pushing for for this production to go up. Th there's you know an increasing amount out there. It's not a lot. It will you know I could pro I can carry it in my hand, which means it's tiny. Uh, but I would still put my bet on that. For, for the moment, for energy. Dawn spacecraft using ion drive has now demonstrated delta Vs, uh, I believe, greater than the launch vehicle that was used to launch it, so around 10 kilometers a second. Why would ion drive not be considered for the, uh, a mission like this? That, um, quick answer, uh, it, we would probably include ion, uh, ion thrusters in, uh, in the trade-off study. Uh, so you're not ruling it out? It's, it's no, I'm table. not ruling it out. I'm not ruling out. It's, it's been coming online. A, a lot of Japanese missions have proven it as well. So we're following that. Okay, anything else? Thanks.